thank you for your continued support of our ministry. For those of you who have been around York or uh, Harbor Drive for a season, you'll, you'll know who I am because I served for 17 years as the pastor of the Stromsburg Baptist Church and so have been in the area a long time. And so familiar faces, it's fun to see. And then I, I, I said this morning, if you're 11 and under, you weren't even born when I moved away, which is hard for me to believe it's been that long. Uh, so it is a joy to be with you this morning. And on behalf of TLI, we, we're just thankful to partner with you, partner with Pastor John, who's traveled with us in the past, uh, in this work to help churches mature by training faithful pastors to fulfill Christ's mission for the glory of God. And that's why TLI exists, and that's what we give our lives to. Just a quick update before we move into the message on our ministry you know, as is true of most churches and most ministries, the last three plus years have been difficult. There have been challenges and change. Uh, we do a lot of short-term ministry work internationally because we teach pastors face-to-face. -face, and for a couple of years, it's pretty hard to travel uh, in this season between 2020 and 2021. Uh, we did have opportunities, though, at times. In fact, our family, uh, my wife and I and our two youngest girls, had the chance to spend three months in Brazil where I was teaching in a little seminary there and able to train up young pastors. It was a great joy to be there. When I first brought up the idea to my family, I thought they were going to say, no, we can't leave home. And now they keep saying, when do we get to go back? And uh, it's great to see what God is doing in their lives to get the, a heart for what he is doing in our world. About the same time, uh, TLI's founder accepted a call to be the lead pastor of a church in Bozeman, Montana, Redeemer Church. And so my transition has been, a, my role changed, and so now I have the opportunity to give leadership to TLI, uh, transitioning into the role of president last July. But I'm amazed that in the midst of the challenges and change, God's shown his faithfulness. We've retrained our, or restarted our training at almost every site. We have over 1,200 pastors right now going through training in 20-some uh, countries. I should know that number off the top of my head, but it always changes constantly. In fact, we were talking to a seminary in Ukraine, about 1,500 pastors, uh, 1,500 churches who are without pastors now because of the war. And uh, how can TLI help uh, train up 1,500 more pastors, which would double what we already are doing? And so... Just pray for wisdom and grace. We have people all over the place. It's been great during the last couple of years to send out more long-term missionaries doing training of pastors. We've got a young couple, young family, four small children in Brazil right now, learning language and culture, and they'll go up to the northeast part of, the Brazil, of Brazil where it's kind of forgotten, and they're there to help lead a little seminary and train pastors to serve in that region. We have another team of families, three families, soon to be five families, serving in the Middle East at a school that's training up pastors who are all immigrants into that country because legally they can't evangelize, but they can plant churches. And so all these workers, which make up 90% of the country, are being trained as pastors and then sent out to plant churches all around the world. It's great to be able to participate in what God does. In fact, you know, every week when we gather as churches, as congregations, we're part of something so much bigger in the world. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that's exactly what's happening today all around the world. And so we as an organization just want to help churches mature in Christ helping them to fulfill that mission for the glory of God. So thank you for your prayers and support. If you want to learn more about what we're doing, you can catch me maybe after the service, uh, or I can would be glad to meet with you sometime. I'm around this week as I am here for the Stromsburg Baptist Church 150th next weekend. Well, I want to invite you now to take your Bible and turn to Psalm 78. We're going to look this morning at Psalm 78, which is the second longest psalm in the book of Psalms. It's 72 verses, and you're already thinking there's a sermon to come, and then there's a, a semi-annual meeting. 
Don't worry, I'm not going to read all 72 verses. We're going to refer to them, but uh, we're only going to look at the first eight verses this morning primarily and then pick out some of the themes that the psalm develops from there. Psalm 78, verses 1 through 8. Hear God's word. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the words of God, but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. This is God's word, breathed out by him, useful for us to teach us, to rebuke us, to correct us, and to train us in righteousness. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and to your word in need of your work in us by your spirit. We do not want to be a faithless generation. We want to be faithful to Christ and to his call upon us as his people to raise up generation after generation after generation of those who would follow after him. And so we ask that you would do this work in our lives, work in our hearts, work in our minds, work in our our schedules, and our lives to conform to your word. And we pray that you do this in our lives now. In Jesus' name, amen. I've always enjoyed history in my life. In fact, I remember when that started. I was after my third grade year of school in the summertime, my family decided to take a vacation, which was pretty unusual in the Tweeton household because there were five kids And we lived on a farm in Iowa with lots of pigs and crops. And so it was really hard to get away from the farm. But my oldest brother was in college and my parents knew that soon he would no longer be coming home. And this was one last chance for a big family vacation. So we loaded up everything, it felt like, the five kids, my parents. We put a little topper on top of the car. You know, this is the 1970s. So that dates me. The toppers looked like the box you get a Big Mac in. It was just a big square that stood really high. Put it on top of the station wagon with paneling like the one I saw driving here this morning. Uh, And we loaded in the car and headed east. The first stop we made was in Gettysburg. We stopped in Gettysburg because my second brother, Doug, who still loves history, loved history at the time, and he wanted to see Gettysburg. He'd been reading about it. And so we spent a day walking on the battlefield where the men had stood, standing on the hills with rocks where you could see where they were uh, hiding. You could imagine how they had hid to avoid the, the uh, cannonballs or the shots that were ringing around them, looking at the gravestones in the cemetery, of those who died in the battle, listening to the reading of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address when he uh, commissioned that gravestone, or that cemetery. And right away I was hooked. I was like, this is great. I I love to imagine, to think about, to reflect on what's gone before. And what interests me about history now is because it's so instructive to us. It was the philosopher George Santayana who said, Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. 
And Asaph, the author of Psalm 78, knew that truth. And in fact, he wanted to help his readers to help us avoid falling into the trap of forgetting the past and therefore repeating it. And so Psalm 78 comes in this section of Psalms written by Asaph, Psalm 73 and uh, 72 to about 81 or 82. As the people are waiting for God's deliverance from and his judgment upon their enemies, that God would revive his people after their unfaithfulness to him and to his covenant. And so Psalm 78 recounts the history of Israel's failures in a previous generation, specifically the failures of the generation that came out of Egypt in the Exodus event, who wandered in the wilderness, and then were the ones who went into the promised land. And he said that generation was characterized by their sin, their rebellion, and their unbelief. And so Asaph begins telling us why he's telling this history. He's telling the history so that this generation, his current generation, would hear and obey. And specifically, Asaph calls Israel to teach the coming generations to put their hope in God, and so not to be like their faithless fathers. So let's look at three lessons that Asaph gives that will enable us to continue in our faith in the Lord, putting our trust in him. The first lesson he gives is to remember. Remember, here's the history. We're going to spend most of our time here because it's the majority of this psalm. Because he says again and again, don't forget. Remember, don't forget. Remember, don't forget. Remember, five times in this psalm, he uses it. Three times he uses it negatively. Verse seven, we read that so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. He uses this image again in verse 11, when he's talking about the Ephraimites, that they forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. And a third time, verse 42, they did not remember his power or the day when he redeemed them from the foe. So they forget They forgot what God had done and so fell into sin. In fact, he uses it once positively, kind of. Look at verse 35. In verses 35 and following, he's talking about the people's returning to the Lord. So verse 34, when he killed them, when God killed them, they sought him. They repented and sought God earnestly. They remembered, here's the remembered positively, that God was their rock, the most high God, their redeemer. Sounds good. And then you read verse 36. But they flattered him with their mouths. They lied to him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast toward him. They were not faithful to his covenant. Remember, this call to remember is a reminder to us that we forget. I think Asaph is building on on what Moses had done in the book of Deuteronomy, where 24 times Moses in Deuteronomy either says, remember or don't forget. Remember, don't forget. And this call to remember is a reminder to the people of their sinfulness, the sinfulness of the generation that came out of Egypt under Moses who wandered in the wilderness, a generation that entered the promised land. In fact, he describes throughout this psalm their sin. What did they do? They disobeyed God's word. They rebelled against God. They tested God. They spoke against God. They did not trust God. They flattered God. They lied to God. Their heart was not steadfast toward God. They worshiped idols rather than God. That's a bleak picture of the people. They had forgotten who God was and what God had done for them. And yet, as a result, they fell into sin. And so Asaph uses these stories to remind them of their failures so that his generation and generations to come wouldn't be like them. In fact, that's exactly what Paul does. If you've got your Bible or your Device, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul does something with the very same story of the Exodus event. 
1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, we'll look at verses 6 to 13, but it's really the whole chapter he's going through this whole idea. Verses 6 to 13. Paul said, Now these things, meaning the things in the wilderness, took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. And then he talks about some of the evil. Verse 7, idolatry. Verse 8, uh, revelry. Verse 9, uh, that's verse 8 as well. Verse uh, 8, sexual immorality. Verse 9, putting Christ to the test. Verse 10, grumbling. Now jump to verse 11 again. Now these things happen to them as an example. He says it again. But they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. We ought to hear the failures of other generations of those around us, the sin, as a way to be a warning in our own lives, lest we fall into the same snare of sin. Paul gives that reminder. And it's a danger to us because we can become very dismissive about our own sin. We think too little of our sin. We run right to the cross. We don't feel the weight of what our sin really is. That's why that list of sins that Asaph reflects on, a God-centered list of disobedience, rebellion, testing God, speaking against God, lying to God, not trusting God, flattering Him, worshiping idols, is so weighty for us. It's so weighty, and it should feel weighty. It's easy for us to to dismiss our sin because we know the story of the cross. We ought to run to the cross, but we also ought to feel the weight of that sin because it's that sin that put Christ on that cross where he bore the wrath of God for us. We also, sometimes uh, when we hear about sin, we become subjective. Not only do you become dismissive, we become subjective, we become relativists, we dismiss our own sin and we really look at the sins of others, how awful their sin is. And we think of our own sin as lighter or less than what somebody else does. And it's such a danger to us because it's why the world thinks of us as hypocrites. If, if the world saw us fundamentally as those who are Repentant sinners pursuing righteousness and holiness in Christ by the Spirit, the weight of their own sin would be felt. I'm reminded that the church in Romania, the evangelical church, has often been called their, their name in, in Romania, the repenters. And, and that should be us. That should be our attitude. That should be our heart lest we look at the sins of others more than our own. There's also a danger that we become introspective, that we look too much to our own sin, and we fail to turn to God's cure for our sin in Christ, which is why Asaph also reminds them not only of their sin, he reminds them of what God has done, that God has been faithful. And so again, in Psalm 78, he's going to emphasize what God has done for the people. Verse 4. Go back to the verse 4. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might and the wonders that He has done. In fact, oftentimes when he's talking about the sin of the people, he condemns their sin because what they've forgotten is what God had done for them already. Instead of reflecting on and meditating on God's kindness to them, his wonders, his works, his redemption, they forgot it. And so we are called to remember the glorious deeds of the Lord, his might, the wonders that he has done. Verse 7 and verse 11, the works of God. Verses 11 and verse 12, the wonders of God. Verses 46 and, or 26 and 42, the power of God. 
Verse 43, the signs that God has given. And so we come in this context to say, what has God done for us? He has delivered us in and through Jesus. But he did it by punishing sin. And so God's faithfulness of what he's done includes that judgment for sin. The the text is clear. He judged the Egyptians. Verses 42 to 51 recounts the Exodus, the plagues that God did to Israel or to Egypt to deliver Israel from the Egyptians. He talks about the judgment God put upon the nations, verse 55, that he drove them out to put his people there in the promised land. He talks about his own covenant people and the judgment that he gives. His judgment was giving them what they desired. He gave them over, verse 29. There's a a craving that they have and he gives them over to their craving, which leads to their death. It's similar to Paul's language in Romans 1. Or if we deny God, he hands us over to what we want. And his judgment is getting what we want, which is in rebellion to him and in absence of his presence. He even shows his wrath and anger toward his people. His wrath and anger toward his own covenant people are mentioned six times in the psalm. Verse 21, verse 31, verse 38, verse 58, verse 59, verse 62. We live in an age where in the church we don't talk often about the wrath of God. And I wonder if if that's not why we have a a low weight of the nature of sin against a holy and righteous God. Because we don't think of God as one who is holy and righteous, who will punish sin. And we need to be aware of who he is. Because if we don't understand that, we won't understand why grace truly is grace. When grace comes to us in Christ as sinners, there is a blessed outpouring of his kindness to us, his affection for us. And we know we don't deserve it. We deserve wrath. But God pours out on us in Christ grace. Grace. It's grace. It's so abundant and free. It's so uh, life giving. And so we, as the church in our generation, need to recapture again who God is and how He has revealed Himself to us. And yet, even here, when He is angry with His people and He expresses that in His wrath, His judgment still was temporary. He still showed mercy. And that's the third thing uh, Asaph emphasizes about what God has done. And he calls them to remember God's mercy toward them as sinners. A, A mercy that expressed itself in the Exodus event. He brought them out, not because of what they've done, but because of his mercy to make them his own people. He did it in the wilderness as he led them by his presence day and night. He provided food for them in the wilderness. He provided water for them. He led them to the promised land and gave him that land. And yet even all along the way, the people rebel. And then verses 38 and 39, even as he's pouring out his wrath, yet he, being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up all his wrath. You hear that? He restrained his anger and wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and comes not again. As God's people, we are those who often forget, but we're called to remember the mercy of God for his people. God remembered. Notice that phrase in verse 30. Nine, He remembered. They forgot, but he remembered. It's an allusion back to uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, maybe it's verse 2. 8, 1, yeah. Noah and his family are in the ark. The flood has happened. They're in the ark. 
Everyone's been wiped out by the wrath of God. And Moses tells us, Genesis 8-1, God remembered Noah and his family. Same thing in Exodus chapter 2, verse 24. The people are in slavery and they're crying out for deliverance. And God remembered his covenant promise to Abraham and he delivered them. We are people that must remember what God has done for us. Dr. Paul Hebert, a missiologist, uh, was a Mennonite heritage in Canada and he spoke of that heritage in a simple formula, but I think a helpful one. He said it this way, one generation of Mennonites believed the gospel and held as well that there are certain practical outworkings that define the Christian faith. So they believed the gospel and they saw these are the implications of it. And then he said the next generation assumed the gospel, but they still identified those specific outworkings as important. The third generation denied the gospel and only held to what it looked like. I think we can see that happen in churches all around us. It's a danger to us because we are apt to forget. And so Asaph calls us, remember, remember. But that's a passive thing we do somewhat. He gives us an active thing we're to do as well. We're to teach. Not only are we to remember, we're to teach. Going back to verse 4 of the psalm. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Verse 5, he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. Why? Verse, seven, verse 6, that the next generation might know them and the children yet unborn and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. So he is calling us to teach what God has done so that the next generation might hold fast to that word. Teach what God has done and teach what God requires. By the way, that order is very important. God's redemptive work always precedes his righteous requirements. What God has done informs what we therefore shall do. Think back again to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 4, Moses is giving an introduction to the Ten Commandments, which he'll say in chapter 5. And in chapter 4, he, he reminds the people, here's what God's done for you. He brought you out of Egypt. He led you on eagle's wings. He carried you like a mother carries her child. And he brought you to this place. And he's making a covenant with you. It's all about what God had done. And in light of that, chapter 5, God gives his commands. Then chapter 6 comes Moses' instruction to parents, beginning with the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit at home, and when you walk along by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. And so that command comes to teach. You ask me why TLI exists. This is why, right here. We exist to train up the next generation, to teach them what God has done for us in Christ so that pastors will be faithful to teach that to the next generation. That's 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, similar to here in Psalm 78. What you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So Paul to Timothy, to faithful men, to other faithful men. On and on and on. We live in a world where many of the leaders who serve churches, many elders and pastors, have no training or little training. And we want to help them move on to maturity. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this story when we're training pastors how to interpret the Bible that they say, I need to go home and repent of every sermon I've ever preached. Because they hadn't been trained. 
And we want to help them. That's why God has given to the church elders, pastors who will preach and teach God's word. It's why the ministry of the church is built and established on the word. We're a word-centered people because it's making God's wonders known that allows him to be rightly worshipped and adored. And as a result, people's lives are changed. And that's what we're about. That's who we are to be about. And it's true of us in our families, not just of the church. It's true in our families. Parents, I've entered the phase not only of parenting, but grandparenting. Grandparents, right? It's our reason to help form our children, to understand who God is and what he has done for us. That's why I love catechism. I actually preached a sermon on parenting and grandparenting in my own church, and I, I was introducing concepts of catechism to the church I attend because it's not common. But it's so helpful for us because it forms. You know, much of Christian parenting for I don't know how many generations, but several generations, has been focused more on right behavior than right belief. More on understanding what to do, how to conform to certain patterns of behavior, rather than delighting in and loving the God who has provided his redemption in Christ. And we are called to labor to that end. And so we teach. So if you're here and you're a parent or you're a grandparent, teach. If you're here, you're an elder, be faithful in teaching because God's word reveals the God of glory. And the end of that glory is our hope, verse 7, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the worst works of God, but keep his commandments. We want to set our hope in God. We remember and teach so that we might hope. Hope in God. That's really the banner over the life of all the teaching that happens in the church. That we would hope not in ourselves, not in our abilities, not in our work, but in God. We remember the works of God. We remember our sin. We teach God's word so that together we might put our hope in God. You know why I come to church every Sunday? I don't get to preach every Sunday like I used to all the time, but why I come every Sunday to church? Because I need to, again, to put my hope in God. I need to hear the gospel. I need to hear the call to confess my sin. I need to hear the finished work of Christ that's forgiven me. I need to hear the hope that is mine, not only for today, but much more for the life to come. And so we put our hope in God. So every Sunday, come to hear again the good news of a God who worked, who has worked for us in his son. You know, the end of this psalm is the best part of the psalm. So turn with me to verses 65 to 72. All along, he's been talking about this generation, the generation that came out of Egypt and that wandered in the wilderness. But it's all leading to the end of the story. Uh, verse 67. Verse 67, he said, He rejected, God rejected the tent of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loves. He built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth, which he has founded forever. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the nursing ewes, he brought them him to shepherd Jacob and his people, Israel his inheritance. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. Do you get the point? Where does our hope lie? It lies not in our ability to do what God has required. It lies in the ability of the son of David, the one who came, 
the incarnate Son of God who lived a perfect, sinless life, who suffered for our sins, and who was raised to life and who reigns at the right hand of the Father, who one day will come again to fulfill all his promises to us, even eternal life. What is our hope? What is our hope in life and death? That we belong not to ourselves, but to Jesus Christ. We are his. So, brothers and sisters, remember, remember all that God has done and who you are in light of him so that you will turn from your sin and trust in him. Remember his wonders. Teach those wonders generation after generation after generation. I get to celebrate 150 years of ministry in Stromsburg Baptist Church next weekend. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful to have had a part in it. But what I want is 10 generations from now, they're still faithfully preaching the gospel. That's what I want to see happen more than anything else. And then hope. We live in a world without much hope. It's pretty depressing to watch the news. But we don't want to watch the news. We want to watch the one who reigns at the right hand of the Father, who is the King, in whom we place our hope. Let's pray.